it's Dr. Betsy Greenleaf, and we're back with another episode. On today's episode, we have Dr. Jen Simmons, and I am so excited to talk to her. She is a cancer surgeon turned functional medicine, actually making a difference in the world, cancer. Uh, basically, you would call yourself almost like a coach, but not so much more than that, because now you're involved in functional medicine. And I love this background story because myself, starting off as a surgeon, I have a, almost a similar career path, but I wanted to ask you, first of all, welcome to our program. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And second of all, tell us about how did you go from what you were doing to now what you're doing? Yeah. So it wasn't an intentional move, right? And I'm sure, you know, we have, we have a ton in common. I mean, redheads. Yes. First of all, um, surgeons and uh, took a circuitous path to get to where we are today as healers in a completely different vein, right? So um, I was very much born into a breast cancer family. My first cousin was a woman named Linda Creed. Linda was a singer songwriter in the 1970s and 1980s. She wrote all the music for the spinners and the stylistic. She was the queen of Motown sound. She had 55 hits in all. She wrote all of them with her writing partner, Tommy Bell. Her most famous song was The Greatest Love of All. She wrote wow. that in 1977 as the title track to the movie, The Greatest, but it really received its acclaim when Whitney Houston re-released it in 1986. So she did that in March, in March of 1986. And at that time, it would spend 14 weeks at the top of the charts. But Linda would never know that because Linda died of metastatic breast cancer just one month later. I was 16 years old at the time. And Linda was literally a rock star and my hero for all obvious reasons, right? And her life and ultimately her death gave birth to my life's purpose. So I knew that I wanted to, in any way that I could, try to prevent other women, other families from having to go through the experience that, that we went through. Because literally from when I was a very young girl, I knew about breast cancer. I knew about how ugly and horrible a disease. It can be. So fast forward, I become a breast surgeon because it's the only thing that I know how to do. And it's 2015. I'm at the top of my game doing really, really cutting edge stuff. And I'm running the cancer program for my hospital. And I'm a surgeon and a wife and a mother and a philanthropist and an athlete. And I have like all these balls in the air thinking that I can do it all. And what happens, but, you know, I get a sign from God that like, you're on the path, but you're not on the right path. So I go from being in what is seemingly the best health possible to I cannot walk across the room without being out of breath. Like I went from all to nothing. And I'm sitting there in my doctor's office, who is a friend and a colleague, and he's telling me that I need surgery and radiation and chemotherapy. And these are things that I say all day, every day without hes hesitation or reservation. But when it's coming at me, it's like I'm in Charlie Brown's classroom, right? All I hear is wah, 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 wah. And I leave the office. I, I tell him that, you know, like I, I can't, I just can't think about this. And there's a voice inside of me and I'm not crazy, but there's a voice inside of me telling me that this is not right for me. And so I go on a quest very selfishly to heal myself. Right. And so I go on Dr. Google and I hear about diet, 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 diet. Now, as a traditionally trained physician, our, our knowledge base, when it comes to nutrition is like minuscule, right? It's, it's, there is almost no importance put on it in medical school training. I had 15 hours of, um, teaching about nutrition in my first year of medical school, and then never again, 
in Mm. all of my medical training. And I had a lot. I'm a fellowship trained oncologic surgeon. Like I had a lot of education. So I enroll in the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and I'm still like a little snooty booty. Like I'm a physician. I'm not overweight. I know everything there is to know. What could they possibly teach me? So I'm sitting listening to one of the first lecturers. It's a man named Mark Hyman. So Mark Hyman comes on stage and introduces himself as a functional medicine doctor. And I'm sitting there like, (laughs) I've been a doctor for 20 years. There is no such thing as a functional medicine doctor. What is this quack talking about? But I decide to check my ego at the door. And within five minutes of this man speaking, my entire life made sense. And I knew that God gave me this diagnosis so that I could be in that room on that day to receive this information to give me clarity because I wasn't living authentically. And that's where my disease developed out of, living without authenticity. And I I immediately enrolled in the Institute for Functional Medicine. So at one time, I might have been doing a little too much. So I was full-time at IIN and full-time at IFM and full-time at my job and full-time at my home. And it was a lot and it took three years, but I did train in functional medicine and got certified in functional medicine. And at that point, I just knew that I had to close the chapter of my surgical life so that I could walk into what I was meant to be doing, which is to help people on a broader scale really heal, to help women with a diagnosis of breast cancer recognize that there's meaning in their diagnosis and to help them discover what their body is trying to tell them so that they can restore their health and live their authentic life. That is such a powerful story. And and I agree with you, but this is where traditional medicine is lacking or even the traditional medicine education. And thank God that you and I have gone through these episodes where we've had to find our own health because now we can take the information that we've learned and help others. But sometimes it's painful to see when I, I see what my colleagues are doing and not that they're doing anything wrong. They just don't know any better because this is not what they're being taught. Right. So, but, but I think, and you and I know this firsthand, it's very, very difficult to appreciate that there is something more when you're not lacking. Right. And so in the, and I was right there, like in the mind of a traditional physician, if these other things that we talk about all day long, diet, mindset, movement, sleep, um, environment, toxins, trauma. If those things were truly important and meaningful, they would have been taught to us in medical school. So this is what we, this is the affliction that we suffer from as traditional medical doctors is that if it wasn't taught to us in medical school, it's either not true or not important. Yeah. Right. And I I talk about this all the time because I think it's quite sad that we think of doctors as critical thinkers, but the truth is that your critical thinking stops the second you start in medical school. And then it is rote memorization, pattern recognition, and um, assimilation, diagnosis, and treatment right? And you're not really critically thinking anymore. You're really calling on what you've learned. And it amazes me that Hippocrates in 440 BC is quoted as saying, let food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. Yet in traditional medicine, we've forgotten this. Completely. Yeah. Completely. I, I still have people come to me with autoimmune disease And they say that, you know, they're rheumatologists and, you know, these are people who have gone to MGH, to Mass General, to Harvard's 
you know, medical school and, and hospital. And they've been told that what they eat doesn't matter. And so here's like, picture me, community doctor with, um, you know, I have an MD behind my name, but I'm also like singing the functional medicine song. And there is a lot of, you know, what, if this is true, why doesn't my Harvard doctor know this? And so I, I think it's coming. I do. I think that you and I are probably like 10 years ahead of the curve. I think it's coming. And thank God people like Mark Hyman have paved the way to this. I mean, in this day and age, like there's a department of functional medicine at the Cleveland Clinic at one of the finest academic institutions in the country, if not the world. So it's coming. It's just not there yet. And, and I can't so Dan, you know, I can't wait like to you and I. Yeah, sorry. No, I was just going to say that people like you and I like just need to hold firm because we we know that the things that we are saying is true. This is so right. And I can't wait to get more into this when we come back from the commercial break. 80% of women will develop a pelvic health condition at some point in their lives. There is relief. There is hope. The Pelvic Floor Store your resource for personal health. All right, and we're back with Dr. Jen Simmons. So Dr. Jen, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you was this idea. I mean, I remember traditionally I learned that cancer was like a genetic thing and, or it was like you were on hormones or, or there was something that caused it, but not what what you talk about with functional medicine. So what are the contributors to cancer and how do we prevent them? Yeah. So first let me say that it's like an easy thing to say that, oh, you're just genetically predisposed, right? Because that lets the doctor off the hook for thinking anymore. And again, it comes back to that. Like we're not, we're not critical thinkers anymore. Like we're really looking at the superficial stuff. What symptoms do you have? Oh, good. Here's your diagnosis. I figured it out. Here's your diagnosis. Take this pill, have this surgery, have this chemotherapy, have this radiation. So the truth is that very a very small part, even in the BRCA mutation population, a very small part of people developing cancer is their genetics. And the, and the lion's share is the environment. So that, you know, there are obvious things that we can, we can connect in terms of the development of cancer. Like we can easily connect smoking to lung cancer, and it does even increase your risk of breast cancer. We can connect radiation to cancer. We can connect chemical exposures to cancer. Like that's the stuff that really makes sense to us, but it's really about that thing that we were talking about before, that living your authentic life, that is the real etiology behind most cancers. Because cancer is a normal response to an abnormal environment. And the key is figuring out why your environment is abnormal or unbalanced or whatever you wanna call it. And this isn't about blame or shame, right? Like no one does anything intentionally ever to cause their cancer. Even people who smoke, they're not smoking for the purpose of causing lung cancer, right? So no one does anything intentionally. And again, not about blame or shame, but it is about taking personal responsibility because you cannot, get well in the same environment in which you got sick. And so there has to be some kind of buy-in recognition that there is something that I can own, something that I can change to allow me to go from that chemistry of stress that allows for the growth of cancer to that chemistry of calm, of peace, of healing. Right, and that's, that's really what we're looking for. So what is it in your environment 
that is leading to that stress chemistry and allowing for the growth and propagation of cancer. And for so many people, it's different. It can be exposures. It can also be trauma. It can be that you're in a toxic relationship. It can be that you're working a job that you're not supposed to be doing. It can be that you're not fulfilling your purpose. It can be, um, you know, relationships that, that aren't working that you need to get out of. And, it, you know, for some people, like I have a whole bunch of marathon runners, right? And they say to me, like, I, I couldn't be any healthier. I run marathons. And I say, like, you know, you're pounding on your feet for hours every day. This is not what you were meant to do. You're not living in authenticity. And it takes a lot of self-reflection and ownership. And not everyone wants this. Like I go to plenty of talks where I speak to the metastatic cancer population because it does make up about 50% of my practice. And I say like, there are things that you can do to take control of your health, to turn this boat around. But there are, there are as many people who want to do that as who say to me, listen, I'm more comfortable taking the drugs and being able to blame them when they don't work because invariably they don't work, right? So everyone who goes that traditional route that has medical, that has metastatic breast cancer or metastatic cancer of any kind, anyone who goes that traditional route, like they don't get cured. They maybe get a couple of extra months, but that's all they get but it's easier for them to blame the drug than to, than to take control. And it does take a lot, like it's not easy. It's never easy to do all of that work, but it's for sure worth it. I always tell patients that are your doctors are, are tools, not meaning like they're tools, you know, like but yeah. they're, tools, <laughs> they're tools in your, your health journey and that they don't necessarily have all the answers that really it's kind of like Dorothy and the wizard of Oz. The answers are within you all the time. And, and, and health happens at home. Yeah. Health doesn't happen in a doctor's office or a hospital or a chemotherapy suite. Like that's not where health happens. Health happens at home. And the only way to get healthy is to have a healthy home which means that, you know, you need to do more than just, you know, eating healthy for some people is enough. And for other people, they also have to make sure that their home is non-toxic, that they're using non-toxic things, that they're in non-toxic relationships, you know, that they're living their life's purpose, that they're moving every day, that they're sleeping well. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it to really create health, but there is a recipe and there is a recipe for everyone and you can do it, right? Like we can all cook in this kitchen, but you have to choose to do it. Do you think that cancer is the, one of the ways that the body's like screaming out for help? A hundred percent. And unfortunately, like we don't listen to the whispers. I mean, I, I happen to know your personal story, so um, I hope you don't mind that I'm going to refer to it, but yeah, go ahead. I had the same thing happen to me where like, you knew you, you knew you weren't happy. Yeah. You knew that you weren't living in authenticity, but you trained for a good long time to do it. And you thought that this was what you were supposed to do. Right. And so you didn't listen. And you, your body made you, made you listen, forced you to listen. You know, you didn't have an accident, yeah. right? So it was the same thing with me. Like, I knew I wasn't living on authenticity. I knew I wasn't changing the trajectory for the people that I was operating on. Like, I, I wasn't changing what was happening with them. I was delaying the next diagnosis. You know, in terms of breast cancer, most women who get breast cancer don't die of breast cancer. Most women who get breast cancer die of heart disease. And it's because it's the same thing at the root of both diseases. It's inflammation. And so unless you change why people are inflamed, you're not changing the trajectory of their lives. They're not living longer. They may not be dying of breast cancer, but they're dying of heart disease. So I knew 
like my patients were getting younger and younger, sicker and sicker, having more and more comorbidities. And I knew that I wasn't really helping them. I was temporarily helping them. I was just bridging them from one diagnosis to the next. And so, you know, when we are not serving our purpose, and I know that you're a woman of deep faith, I'm a woman of deep faith, like God tells us, says, you know, and in everyone's diagnosis, there's a message. You just have to look for it and be, and be willing and open to explore it and, and listen to it. But we're, we're all called to something. You know, this is kind of matches up with a, a study I saw recently that said people that go into cancer treatment with a good attitude tend to ha- live much longer and have higher rates of just doing better than people who go in with a bad attitude. Yeah, they have longer disease-free survival. They have way better response to treatment and they have less side effect. So what we think about grows and we all need to be very, very intentional of where we put our attention and what we allow in. So, you know, boundaries are there for a reason. They're there to keep the bad stuff out, but they're also to keep the good stuff in. And we, we need to be our own gatekeepers. We need to decide what we're going to think about, where we're going to focus our energy, and what our intentions are. And if our intentions are to build health, we can do that. We have that control. Dr. Jen, it has been amazing talking with you. I know you have a health summit coming up. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. So um, this is going to be my second summit of Beyond the Cancer. Right now we are focused on breast cancer and this is for anyone anywhere along the spectrum, whether you're looking for prevention or you've been diagnosed, you're in treatment, you've completed treatment, you have metastatic disease, like this is it for everyone. And it's all the drivers of health. And again, health happens at home. So these are all the ways that you can support your health, boost your health, bolster your health, and, and you know, within the confines of your own home. I'm so excited for that. And we're going to make sure that everybody gets the link to sign up for that program. So make sure you check out the show notes. And where else can people find information about you? So my website is realhealthmd.com. There you can learn about my course, My Answer to Breast Cancer. Um, I have a cookbook coming out in just a couple of weeks. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll make sure that you get access to that. And, um, and if you want to apply to work with me, there's an application right there on my website, realhealthmd.com. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. So happy to be here. So I just want to remind everybody, please go check out Dr. Jen's sites. And also when you're there, go check out me at drbetsygreenleaf.com, the pelvic floor store, and also on any social media, you can find me one way or another, uh, at Dr. Betsy Greenleaf. And don't forget to share and like both my stuff and Dr. Jen's stuff and come back again next week to listen to another episode. All right. Once again, thank you so much. Bye for now.